Learning Module 8, Strength of Beam Columns. We begin by defining the geometry of the beam column. To do this, we'll select Geometry, Define Frame. In this case, we're going to just have one vertical column. So we'll select one story. And the length of the column is 15 feet, 15 times 12 or 180 inches, and then we'll hit Apply. Next, we'll subdivide the column into eight elements. So we'll go into Geometry, Subdivide Elements. We'll pick the column, and out at the base, we'll run the number of segments up to eight, and then hit Apply. Because these will be 3D analyses, let's change the view to isometric. By default, Mastan orients the elements for strong axis bending in the XY plane and minor axis bending in the YZ plane. We can see this by selecting View, Labels, Element Web. The blue tick marks that you can see represent the direction of the web. So we have strong axis bending in the XY plane and minor axis bending in the YZ plane. We'll now turn off those tick marks as well as the element and node labels. Turn off the node numbers, and we'll turn off the element labels. Because a potential failure mode in this study will be lateral torsional buckling, it's important that we have warping continuity between the element ends. We can include this warping resistance by selecting geometry, Define connections. All of our elements will be warping continuous at each end. So I'll select that for both ends. Hit apply, and the warping restraint has been defined. Because lateral torsional buckling may be one of the failure modes we're looking for, we're going to provide a few extra nodes and elements so we can actually see twisting. Otherwise, we would not be able to see twisting with just the line elements. So to do this, I'll select Geometry, Duplicate Nodes. I'll select the center node, and I'll duplicate it once 7 inches in the X direction. Hit Apply. I'll then hit that center node again and duplicate it minus 7 inches in the X direction. The 7 inches is half the width of a W14. Hit Apply. Then I'll take these two nodes and I'll duplicate them four inches in the Z direction. Hit Apply. And then I'll take those two nodes again and duplicate them minus four inches in the Z direction. And hit Apply. Now I'll connect the nodes with elements. So under Geometry, Define Element. Click on two nodes, let's say this node and this node. Hit Apply. Find another element by clicking on this node and this node, hitting Apply. Click on a node, another node, hit Apply. Node, Node, Apply. Click on this node and this node, Apply. And then the final part of the flange, this node and this node, and hit Apply. Now it's important to note that these additional nodes and elements will have no impact on the results. They'll simply ride along the rigid body motion that's provided by that node halfway up the column. But in doing so, we'll actually be able to see any twisting should it occur. We'll now go on and define the section of material properties. We select Properties, Define Section. We could type in all the values down at the bottom, but instead we'll locate it in the database. We selected Database. We scroll down until we find our 14 by 53. Click on it. The values have now all been typed in but they won't be stored as Section 1 until we hit Apply. So I hit Apply. I'll now attach those properties to all the elements. So I'll select Properties, Attach Section, Select All, and hit Apply. Now I did uh, attach a W14 by 53 section property to those artificial or dummy elements that we provided. Again, it's no problem. They just need to have uh, section properties. They can be anything they want because they're not going to resist force in any way. 
Now we'll define and attach the material properties. So we'll select properties, define materials. Down at the base, we'll type in steel as the material name, provide an E value of 29,000, an FY value of 50. Note that we'll let the weight density reside at zero, so we will not be including the self weight of the members in any of the analysis. And then we'll hit apply. I'll now go on and attach this material property to all the elements by selecting materials, I'm sorry, properties, attach material. I'll select all and then hit apply. All the elements are now solid, indicating they have both section and material properties defined. So we can move forward now and define the boundary conditions. So we'll select conditions, define fixities, and define the support conditions. I'll select the base of the column the bottom node here, and I'll click on the X, the Y, and the Z translation, as well as the Y rotation. Then I'll hit apply. I'll clear the list, select the top node, release the displacement in the Y direction, and then hit apply. With the support conditions defined, I'll now apply the forces. So I'll select Define Forces. And in the minus Y direction, I'll type in the compressive load of minus 246.0. I'll select the top node, and then I'll hit Apply. Now I'll go on and apply the end moments. So I'll select Conditions, Define Moments, select the bottom node, and provide a value of positive 230, and then hit Apply. I'll then clear the list, select the top node, change the moment to minus 230 so the beam is in uniform bending, and then hit Apply. The preprocessing is now complete. We have a beam column that does not include initial imperfections, so the first time what we'll do is we'll complete the analysis required to do the AISC interaction equation check. This will be done by going under Analysis and selecting Second Order None of the parameters down at the base need to be changed, so we can just hit Apply. We can obtain the required strengths by plotting the axial force in minor axis moment diagram. So let's do that. Under Results, we'll select Diagrams, Axial Force, and hit Apply. As expected, the axial force is 246 kips, precisely what we applied. Let's have a look at the minor axis bending moments. To do this, we'll select Results, Diagrams, Moment Y, and then hit Apply. We can see that the largest minor axis bending moment is 495.1 kips. Now we only had 230 at each end, so this axial force and the bending are producing quite a bit of second order effects. We'll record these values in the tables provided in the learning module. Now would be a good time to save this model, because what we're going to next do is go back and include an initial imperfection. But we do not want to include the initial imperfections when we do the other AISC uh, checks. So we'll have a separate model. To clean up the screen a bit, I'm going to select Cancel, Results, Diagrams, and None. Now there are a few ways that we could include an initial imperfection. One way would be to go under Geometry and use the Move Node option. But we'd have to move each one of the nodes, and this could be quite tedious. There's another way to do it, and that is we'll apply a load mid-height on the beam column, and we'll bend it in the direction in which we want to have the initial imperfection. And then we'll update the geometry. So to do this, let's first remove those moments and axial force that's on there. So I'll go under Define Moments, Select All, and hit Apply. With the moments gone, I'll now go ahead and modify the forces. So I'll select Define Forces, click on that top node, and hit Apply. I'll clear the list, select that node mid-height, and I'm going to provide a force of, say, 10 kips in the positive Z direction, and then hit Apply. Using this 10 kip force to bend the, the beam column, I'll go under Analysis and perform a first order elastic analysis. I'll hit apply and the analysis is complete.
Let's have a look at the deflected shape. So under results, diagrams, deflected shape, and then we'll hit apply. As expected, our column has been bent in the minor axis direction. We can now update the geometry to include this initial imperfection in our original model. To do this, I'll select results, update geometry. I'll select the node of interest, mid height, select the direction in which I want to scale the deformation, so in the Z direction. The value I'd like to have is 15 feet times 12 inches per foot divided by 1,000. Hit apply. And the geometry has been scaled so that the, there is now an out of straightness in the column of L over 1,000 at that center point. So we'll go back and confirm this by using the geometry information node and then clicking on this center node. Down at the base, you can see that for node 6, we have coordinates of effectively 0 in the x direction, 90 in the y, and the, uh, the z-coordinate is 0 0.18, and that's the length of the beam column, which was 15 feet or 180 inches, divided by 1,000. Now, if we clicked on the other nodes, we'd see that they have also been moved slightly in the z-direction, forming that shape that we're seeing there in blue. The shape, though, is grossly magnified that we see in blue. Let's cancel out of this and turn off that diagram by selecting Diagrams, None. The last thing we'll do is turn off that force that we use to bend it. So under Conditions, select Define Forces. And for all nodes, we'll set the value of forces to zero by hitting Apply. Hit Cancel. And at this point, we've now gone through and included an initial out of straightness of our column and the amount of L over 1,000 in the minor we now need to go back and provide that compressive force and bending moments. So first we'll select Define Forces, select the top node, and in the Y direction, type in 246 negative, and then hit Apply. We'll also go back and put those moments back on. So under Conditions, Define Moments, we'll select the bottom of the beam column. And again, the moment here was positive 230 and then we'll hit Apply. We'll clear our list, select the top node, change the sign of the moment to be minus 230, so we have uniform bending, and then hit Apply. So we're back to where we were before, but in this case, the column now has an initial imperfection, as well as those end moments in compressive force. We'll now perform this second order inelastic analysis by selecting Analysis, Second Order Inelastic. We will need to define the analysis parameters down at the bottom. Our increment size will be 0.01. The maximum number of increments will set artificially high, so the analysis will run. Our maximum applied load ratio will also set to 100. This way, the analysis will run and not stop until the member fails. Now, it's very important that we change this modulus from E to ETM. That way, the analysis will use the modified tangent modulus approach and include partial yielding accentuated by residual stresses during the analysis. We'll then hit apply and the analysis will be performed. Next to the status, we can see that the applied load ratio is at 0.96 and the analysis was halted because the limit was reached. This means that we have failed our beam column at 96% of the applied load. Let's have a look at the deflected shape. So we'll go into Results, Diagrams, Deflected Shape, and then hit Apply. We can see that the column has experienced flexural buckling about its minor axis. There is no twist, so there must not be any lateral torsional buckling occurring. I'd now suggest that you save this model with a different name so that you can use it to do all the studies that employ second order inelastic analysis. This concludes Learning Module 8.